Okay, my name is Evan Scheibel for CG Toots Plus, and um, in this tutorial, we're going to take a look at creating a photorealistic candle in 3D Studio Max and Toxic. Um, both these are Autodesk products, uh, obviously 3D Max, but many of you might not know what Toxic is. Now, <coughs> Toxic, what it's created for um, is you know 2K and 4K uh, CinemaScope. Uh, you know, compositing, high-end film compositing, and um, that's probably why it's it's not used so much in the mainstream. Now you can use just normal HD, even SD footage in Toxic. It handles it very well, better than most. Um, but it's made to handle huge 4K images, um, and it's made to composite broadcast and and cinema and feature film stuff. But we're going to take a look at this because I really, really uh, like Toxic. Uh, it's probably my favorite compositing uh, app, <coughs> compositing package. Second probably only to Nuke. So we're going to use this. And uh, because of this, this is going to be a little different tutorial. We're not just going to look at 3D and rendering. What we're going to do is look at 3D rendering and compositing, and specifically multi-pass compositing. Um, and hopefully soon there'll be a follow-up tutorial to this one that deals specifically with high-end multi-pass compositing. Um, and we'll be using Toxic or Nuke for that, most likely Toxic. Um, but these principles, I don't want you to get confused because these principles are transferable across the compositing spectrum. Um, this isn't just you know a technical demonstration for Toxic. What this is... Um, is just relaying principles of compositing that you can use uh, in After Effects, Shake, Nuke, uh, Flame, you know, Flint, Inferno, uh, Toxic, whatever compositing application that you're using, you can you can employ these uh, these resources in order to get a better result in your work as well. So this is how Toxic, but this is obviously going to include uh, some technical information for Toxic specifically. Um, one thing in particular that I'm going to uh, kind of demonstrate here is right from the start screen. Uh, a lot of people have, you know, newcomers to Toxic have a lot of trouble getting into it and getting started. So what I want to do is show um, just how to get up and running. So um, I'm going to just click Candle Toot and then I'm going to hit Open. Now, um, it's going to open up my thing and it's blank. There's nothing there. Now, um, a lot of people get, you know, the, the first thing you do in After Effects, you bring in footage, you know, and you and you just get right going. You kind of hit the ground running. Same thing with Nuke. Um, not so sure about Shake. Most likely, same thing. But in Toxic, you have some preliminary work that you have to do. Um, because this is such a high-end package, you know, you have to prepare Toxic to start working. You have to, like, you, you have to set your resolution, color depth, all that stuff. Um, it makes you do that first. Um, but I've done that. I have compositions created already. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come to open. And these are the compositions, the footage, and the different workspaces saved for this specific project. So I'm going to open up this candle, and you can see it opens up in my schematic view. Uh, I've got a preview over here, and you can see that we've got you know a photorealistic candle here. It's obviously not composited into real footage. Um, I didn't have that kind of time or patience <laughs> to work with this. Um, but what I've done is I've taken numerous different passes that I've rendered out of 3D Studio Max that are specific for a Fume Effects workflow, and I've used those to make a really, really, really nice result here in Toxic. And that's what we're going to demonstrate here first is the comping, simply because we've spent a lot of time in Fume Effects in the last tutorial, um, and this one's kind of a follow-up tutorial for that. Um, like I said in the in the first one. So we've overviewed Fume Effects, we've gotten really deep into its interface, and um, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at how to practically apply that not only in 3D uh, but also in compositing, which there's so few compositing tutorials dealing with, um, at least free, dealing with Fume Effects. So hopefully this will be, uh, be useful. So let's get going here. This is uh, this is, you know, Toxic at its base level. Um, now, the thing about Toxic and the reason I like it so much is because of the UI navigation. 
Now, it's not just everything here is not just stuck up on in your face and you have to kind of battle for screen real estate. That's not how these applications work. Um, how, what you do is, is this whole interface is what's called gesture based. Now, if you're you know using Windows 7, you kind of understand that a little more. Um, but that's kind of becoming a very, very popular thing now. Now, this is Toxic 2008. Uh, service pack one so it's you know it's not you know the newest version but still it has really intuitive UI based on gestures um, and what you do is you middle click and you get this you got the composition browser pick list schematic or, in, or schematic <coughs> these are all three different views that you can you can access from this gate right here so let's say we I want to see the pick list which is all of my tools I just go over that way and I let go of the click see that you didn't get time to see it but you just go over and let go and you got the pick list over here schematic view pops that up on your screen for you right there and as long as you stay hovered you can work and do whatever you need to in here as long as you stay over this schematic flyout that comes up as soon as you go off that goes and you're back to your you know to your base uh, UI here you go this way and you've got your composition browser you go down and you get like whatever display you have selected you get options for that display so that's just a quick kind of down or quick and dirty way to uh, get up and running with the interface in Toxic uh, a few other little little things that you'll have to get used to if you're used to like After Effects or Nuke or something but uh, once you get used to this UI you'll fly around it and it won't be a won't be a problem at all okay so um, I rendered out a few different passes here uh, let's go into my schematic view you can see here's the beauty pass um, now you can see them here but also this is my tool output this is my composition output my schematic view and then all of my different options are here so when you click on a node you can see the tool output here so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick with this little view just because I know what everything is right now um, but as we start working and going through these other nodes, I'm going to end up working in this view and then flying back and forth so we can see. Okay, so this is my source footage. This is what's called a beauty pass, uh, which is an RGB render, uh, red, green, blue, just full color render, uh, one pass right out of 3D Studio Max. And I've used that here um, because I'm not really compositing this into a scene. Uh, I've already kind of built a little room and things for it and simulate some depth of field with a chamfer and uh, different things like that. But uh, if you were to comp this into real footage, then um, what you would do is you would obviously just render that on a blank alpha. You'd have a lot more to do in comp uh, than we're doing here. But because this is, you know, got a time limit here, I wanted to be quick about what I was doing. So this is just my beauty pass um, no color correction nothing as you can see it goes right into my blend node but here I've got another little interesting pass which is you can only get from Sydney Saudi uh, products now the reason for that is I'm just gonna take a take a quick second here to uh, just explain the way that fume effects and dreamscape and afterburn the way that these kind of uh, hook into the 3D Studio Max rendering system and that's what's with uh, what's called the Fusion Works renderer. Now what that is is um, it takes the, the volumetric data that Sydney Saudi plugins like you know uh, Inlight and uh, Fume Effects and Afterburn create all of that volume data and what it does is it, it pipes that into the the native renderers like you know Final Render V-Ray uh, I think the newest versions of most of the plugins support V-Ray, Mental Ray, uh, Standard Scanline Renderer. It pipes that volumetric data into those renderers, and then what happens is you can now get that data renderable, whereas before you couldn't. Uh, it's kind of like working with PFLOW. There's you have to you know set up all your displays and stuff, uh, and your shaders and textures and and shapes and sizes to get that to be renderable. Um, unless you're working with Krakatoa, but um, normal, normal, like normal people, <laughs> they, they they can't just render a particle. Uh, it's kind of the same concept. So what Sydney Saudi did is they developed the the uh, FusionWorks renderer, uh, which pipes that data in. So 
Because of that, we can get some interesting render passes when, de when working with theme effects and when dealing with uh, comping those things together. And if you look here close, you can see there's a difference in the, and this is the beauty pass, there's a difference in this image besides color correction. Uh, two things you can see. One is if you look here at the shadow. Now, all I did in 3D Studio Max was I rendered out just hard shadows, just the final render shadow map. Uh, if I was using mental ray, it was just a normal shadow map for the renderer that I was using. Consequently, I didn't get good soft shadowing. I got only hard shadows. Uh, but you can see over here I've got so nice soft shadows because we're dealing with just a subtle glow here from the candle flame and just a key light off behind the camera kind of off to the side. So we're just getting a nice subtle glow shadow from the handle and then a shadow coming in like this casting it onto the ground. Okay, so I've done uh, a certain pass out of FusionWorks renderer, uh, FusionWorks shadow pass. Uh, which calculates not only the lighting in the scene, but also the multiple scattering and the light from the flame itself. And I've used that to simulate soft shadowing. We'll go into that uh, in a minute. Also what I've done <clears throat> is I've taken a flame pass, which is specific. See, here's the shadow pass. And then I've taken the flame pass, uh, which again, specific only to Sydney Saudi plugins, Sydney Saudi FusionWorks renderer. I've taken that pass to simulate, if you look at the difference, to simulate the glow. If you look at this nice, warm, uh, hot glow that the flame creates in the final product, you'll see a huge difference. And um, now it's important to keep in mind when working with fume effects and when working with these, these things, you know, all around and all throughout the spectrum, you don't necessarily have to do it in 3D. Um, if there's a way to do it in compositing, that's faster usually um, because it takes, you know, literally a split second to render out an extra pass. Uh, you know, it takes hard, if you have a good machine, it takes hardly any calculation data at all. Um, okay, so uh, on another thing, I'm working with Open EXR image sequences, which is if you really want to, you know, stay with the industry right now, learn to work with EXR image sequences. Uh, guess what? Everything supports the best anymore. Um, and that it, that's probably the best workflow that you can you can find. So work with EXR. Um, there's plenty of stuff on the web on the on the internet about that. Uh, just do some Google searching and you'll find out about it. Okay, so we start with our beauty pass and um, what I've done is I've taken this pass and I've added a glow. Now this is helpful. Why? Um, well, if you're used to working with layers and uh, and single pass renders and you know and if you're just a hobbyist, well, what you're going to be do what you're going to probably end up doing is taking your beauty pass, which is this pass, and and you're going to just add a glow to it and then mask that glow so it's localized around the flame. But in a package like this, you're going to run into some problems when you mask out the glow node. Is some just hard edging and some different things because you're not supposed to really do that. Um, there's a place for it, but uh, this isn't the place for it. So what I've done is I've taken the flame pass. That allows me to localize the glow only to the flame. Uh, so then I've glowed that. You can see here, added a nice warmth to it. And then I've blended and comped that. The good thing about the blend and comp node within um, Toxic is you've got not only the just the basic merge operation, which is the same as the merge operation in Fusion, Shake, uh, maybe Shake. I've never used Shake, but uh, same as Fusion, Nuke, um, except this one you've got right out in the front, not hidden. You know, you've got all the different blend modes. And, and even some added ones. You've got all the same ones from Adobe products, but you've also got like Spotlight, Spotlight Blend, um, you know, Value, all these different things that, that aren't found there. I've just used Add because that performs that mathematical operation. It just adds the color data to the already uh, existing image. So um, that's a good way to get a nice glow. Uh, if you're dealing with flames, not explosions, you could try it. Uh, it might work. Um, I've never really done this technique with with explosions, but for a candle flame, any flame like this, this is a good way to localize that glow and to really get it looking nice. Okay, and then I've blended that, and here we have another blend node, and that uh, is blending this little layer, I guess you could say. 
essentially what I've done here um, to kind of bring this down is each one of these sets of nodes you could say is a pre-comp if you're used to After Effects um, that would be the like the operation of laying those two on top of each other and then the final color corrections and stuff but e both of these would be a pre-comp if you're an After Effects user so um, that's just a kind of an easier way to understand it I guess so here we have my shadow pass <clears throat> Now this is the FusionWorks Shadow Pass, so that includes within it uh, the data from the flame. Uh, so we we've got some nice, you know, hard shadowing in this. Uh, I didn't want necessarily all hard shadowing because, like I said, we're dealing with that little subtle glow. So I've blurred that, and if you look here, you can see the difference. Here we've got that, and then I, I've blurred this. So we keep the hard shadow data, but we also have now added that soft shadowing. Uh, and then I've glowed that, which doesn't really do much. You can't really tell until you, um, until you comp it, because again I've used the blend and comp with a multiply that performs that mathematical function. It multiplies the data with what we already have. Um, you could add that most likely, um, maybe overlay. Any of those would look decent, but um, you can see what we end up with here if I turn off my uh, I'll just leave that for now anyway I'm just trying to save frames but you can see what we're dealing with and what we've got you see we've got some hard shadowing there once we do that we've got nice soft shadows that are a lot more uh, realistic to the light that we're dealing with and then I've taken a photo lab node and done some color corrections and um, almost almost to the final here we've got two last things I've blurred this now if we look here I've also garbage masked this if I disconnect the garbage mask and then look here it blurs out the entire image now two things I've done uh, there are two reasons I did this uh, one is this is a scene specific thing this isn't uh, you know all around the spectrum but one reason I did this is because I didn't want to render out depth of field because this was a you know sequence for a training video there the time wasn't there you know and everything so I really wanted to fake some depth of field so what I did is I chamfered these back edges if you look here I chamfered these back edges this is a cube and I really heavily chamfered these and then uh, to simulate that depth of field I just blurred out the entire image and then uh, garbage masked um, that blur so you can see and I just kind of you know rotoed that a little bit and what we come up with is this which is some really nice simulated depth of field got a band here um, it could be but that's you know lens glare and stuff like that so that's a, a good way to work uh, if you're <laughs> cheap like I am <laughs> that's you know obviously not production right there but uh, so that's what we come up with and uh, so this will kind of end the toxic portion uh, of this tutorial. I hope it was helpful. Um, hope you learned some things about using the passes and the different things that you can get from fume effects in order to really, uh, you know, dig in there and get maximum control over your image. I just did the little technique that I, I like with the flame and the shadows here when dealing with candles and candle flames and, and subtle lighting and flames. Uh, specifically so there's a ton more you can do uh, we'll be covering that in a later tutorial I'll be doing for toxic with a, just a huge multi-pass tutorial where we just go through all that and composite so I'm gonna pause the recording now and um, we're going to jump into 3d studio max and we're gonna look at how to render those and the settings that are used to make this candle flame because believe it or not this candle flame is not as easy to make as it looks so I'll pause this and I'll see you then in 3d studio max okay here we are in 3d studio max um, what we're going to do now is kind of look at the fume effect settings and the render settings I use to get not only the passes but also uh, that specific flame effect. I want to apologize right now for the screen resolution. The reason I've done this is because Toxic uh, only works at 19, uh, 
20 by 1200 resolution. Uh, so you need like a big, like I've got a huge 28 and a half inch monitor because you need that to work with Toxic. It's a lot of hardware specifications to work with that, uh, at least the way it's supposed to be worked with. So that's the reason for this huge screen resolution. Um, so I apologize for that, but I wanted to really get that that in there and kind of show you uh, that portion of it. Anyway, so in Max, um, what we're going to do here is just look through the fume effect settings. Now I'm not going to recreate the scene. Um, it took way too much trial and error to get that flame exactly right. Um, usually you'll find that's what it is. Um, but to know a general kind of area that you want to get yourself into before you start using the trial and error is always good. Um, now working with fume effects, like right here, these settings aren't going to be, you know, a mold that you can use in your own project. Uh, these settings are kind of specific to the scene scale and, and different things like that and uh, because of spacing values and, and, and other things. Now if these term if these terms seem foreign to you um, what you need to do is to go back and watch the fume effects overview tutorial that I've done on here right here on CG Tools Plus um, because we cover everything that you need to know to get started with fume effects so you can just jump in and go and um, okay so uh, let's just do that I'm gonna open my UI here my floater and um, you can see we've got general tab here my spacing is set low because this is set for my final render um, now if I do a render here just really quick okay you can see that there's nothing there come to like frame 55 okay now I've done a few tricks here <laughs> Um, now when it comes to my shaders I've just used final render shaders actually I think final shaders I use for the wax <coughs> so it's just a subsurface scattering shader low specularity um, just anyway if you want that shader let me know uh, I can upload this shader you can have it if you use final render um, but anyway this isn't about shaders um, so I've just created a simple wax shader with a, you know a pretty heavy translucency and um, and obviously subsurf so that you get some nice internal glow uh, because with wax and with this candle you're not gonna you know the glow is so subtle that it's not gonna travel down the outside of that shaft um, you need some internal glow with wax um, so that's what I've done and in order to get the glow in the candle wax the flame actually is totally useless uh, I actually just used an omni light uh, use the near and far attenuation and set those to about halfway down the candle and I made the color um, orange the color of the flame there so that was kind of a cheat uh, I don't know if there's a way to do that in fume I haven't found it multiple scattering only works on the smoke flame relationship it doesn't really work with the scene too much so you kinda have to hack your way around when it comes to that um, hopefully sooner or later Sidney Saudi will come up with a way to uh, light the scenes with the flames uh, if, there ha if they have I've not used it anyway so anyway that's how I've gotten that nice glow into the candle wax um, and honestly, uh, even if you could use the flame, I don't think I would. Uh, it's just a lot more controllable with this Omni Light. So that's what I've done there. Now, to get this realistic shape for the flame, it was a little tricky. I tried using a simple source at first, but that didn't really work. Um, I always got you know the same kind of rounded. Uh, just it wasn't realistic to the to the placement of the flame. Uh, it was a good looking flame, but just not a candle flame. So what I did here. Is if you if I look here in my view, bring this around. You can see I have my wick here. Now, um, oh by the way, this model was downloaded from 3D Ar or Archive 3D. If you haven't been to that website, check it out. There's like I don't know, like 12,000 free 3D models or something like that. You can find all sorts of crazy stuff on that website. 
and they're all high quality. It's well, most of them are high quality. So you can find city models, all sorts of, and it's all legally free. People, you know, who've made these models submit them to this website. It's not, you know, hacks and rapid share downloads and stuff like that. It's it's legal stuff. So go check that out. Uh, that's where I got this candle. Um, and uh, yeah, so I use the wick here for an object source, and um. In my simulation settings, uh, my maximum iterations I sent to about 120. The reason for that is we don't have a super high speed uh, thing. We don't really need that that uh, subframe uh, simulation really. So uh, I've lowered that down from 200, which is default to 120. Uh, simulation steps one. Excuse me. So most of this right now is at default. My gravity and buoyancy is all at default. Um, let me show you one thing here. Well, nah. Um, okay. So my uh, most things here are default. Uh, you don't have to change too much if you're not trying to get like a a, a stylistic f uh, flame, and that's usually where people err. Is a lot of people will come in, they'll tweak all the different settings around, and and they'll think that they have it where they need. Like they'll be thinking, okay, I need this much turbulence, and they'll have like a candle flame pictured in their heads. Um, and they'll be doing it with the settings before they even look at the result, um, which is uh, where a lot of people go wrong because then they're stuck dealing with all these tweaked settings, trying to bring it around and bring it back to what they need it to be, and they'll never get it. If they do, it'll take forever. So when working with Fume, unless you know where you need to be, leave them at default and work from there. Um, so the only thing I changed here in the systems is my uh, three different things. Uh, my vorticity, which is kind of it, 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 that is kind of the internal movement of the flame. Uh, I brought that down to 0.7 from one, um, because if you look at a candle flame, it doesn't have too much internal movement. It, the, the flame itself, as a whole, moves around as the wind moves it, and you know, the just kind of ambient air in the room moves it around. But there's really no internal turbulent movement. So I brought that down about halfway, and I brought the velocity dampening up. Uh, quite a bit because you don't have unless you're you've got a you know a windstorm uh, or some breeze or a drafty room you don't have a really you know turbulent flame on a candle it's really really kind of slow and graceful looking so I brought the velocity dampening to about point seven I don't know if that's down or up but regardless what it's done is um it's it's usually it's at zero default so um. What that's done is that's kind of taken the movement of the flame and suppressed it. Uh, so you've just got a nice, graceful, slow-moving flame. However, I did add some turbulence. Uh, the reason for that is you do have some movement. Um, so I've brought the turbulence just just barely, barely noticeable. And I've brought the scale down to three. Um, that just makes it hardly noticeable at all. The detail all the way up and the frame rate, or the, the, rev the frames... Uh, now, if you watch the other tutorial, you'll understand what this, what the frames is. But what that is, is it's just uh, if you're used to using turbulence in like After Effects or as backgrounds or as you know noise maps, you'll understand that there's a revolution property there where when the turbulent noise moves. So um, that's how many frames it takes for it to kind of move and come back to to like its uh, initial state. Uh, just kind of a 100% revolution of that noise. So it takes six frames in this case to do that. And everything else down here, I've I've not changed too much. I brought the burn rate down a little. Um, now when you when you dampen your velocity, what's going to happen is your flame's not going to rise up as high. Um, but if you lower down the burn rate, what that does essentially is it makes that flame burn the fuel hotter and more which therefore is going to result in the flame rising higher. And I've also brought my expansion to 4. Um, and that, um, pretty much what that's going to do is make the flame expand out from its source, um, you know, 4 times more than it, than it normally would if you left that on default. Okay, so, um, and that's about it, I think, for, for the simulation here, simulation tab, yeah. If I come to my rendering slot, uh, most things, like I said, are normal, just default settings. And here we have the color. Now this is pretty important. You can see that if if I come here and I render, 
here. You can't really see the blue, but if you look in the fun, you can just see a bit of a glint of it there. If you look in the final product, however, you can because I've prepared this for comp. Um, I haven't really prepared this uh, render for like a final, you know, uh, you know, perfect effect when it comes to rendering out of 3D because I know that I'm going to send this through the comp the compositing pipeline. It's not just going to come out of 3D and end up at the director's hands like this. Uh, so what I've done is I've made this so when I comp two of those together or even three or four and when I add a nice glow to these flames it that blue is going to come out and if you look at the preview you can see the blue just a little bit better than you can here and it is supposed to be just subtle. So I just added that to like the middle of the flame and then I've got pretty much a normal gradient other than that. Okay, no smoke. Uh, if you look in my simulation tab, I don't have simulate smoke ticked. Uh, just would have added to, you know, given us unnecessary simulation times. Uh, you don't really need to simulate the smoke here unless you're going for that specific effect. Alright, um, that's about it. Everything else is pretty much default here. In my illumination, I have two spotlights, as you can see. Um, and then uh, that's first mainly that affects the smoke. It doesn't really affect the fire too much. But you can see I didn't add the Omni Light into this system. Um, because if I were to do multiple scattering, Omni Lights tend to add, you know, hundreds of thousands of lights uh, to, the, to the lighting simulation. Um, you can go through the help file to figure out what that is. But uh, essentially it's taking that light source and it adds a light. It, it simulates lights all around uh, based on that light source. Uh, you can look at it in the help file to really get a good grasp about what the multiple scattering does. But when you, Omni lights tend to really slow down the simulation because it's a 360 degree light, uh, whereas a spotlight, it just, you can, whatever you know angle you set it at, that's where it's going to shine. Uh, Omni lights aren't like that. So I didn't add that, plus I don't need to because I've only used that Omni light for the glow effect in the candle wax. Okay, and then uh, my object source, that's all default, and all I did was add it. And then for the object, I added the wick. Okay, and that's pretty much it for my settings. Um, you might say that, well, that looked pretty easy. Um, well, believe it or not, that took me about an hour and a half of trial and error to get that candle flame, you know, precisely the way I wanted it to be. And um, so that gives you just an idea of the general area you want to set yourself in to get going with making a simple candle flame um, or just a simple flame like that uh, just a non turbulent flame uh, because it can be tough uh, especially with, with you know the visual effects guys like me we're used to doing huge explosions and turbulent flames and things like that and uh, we think what looks good is what's you know crazy and cool looking but you know that's true it looks good but it's not always appropriate uh, like for this, uh, you know, a highly visual flame that was turbulent and moving around a lot, and it just wasn't appropriate. Uh, sometimes we have to sacrifice what looks cool for what actually looks real. And um, that's usually what we have to do in visual effects and compositing, is it might look good this way, it might look cool, but the director wants it to look real. Uh, so make it look real, even at the sacrifice of some coolness, I guess. Um, one last thing I want to look at is my render settings. I'm just assuming you have a general knowledge of, of 3D Studio Max here, so I'm hitting buttons all over and you see windows pop up. I said F10 to bring up my render settings. And in Final Render, which is pretty much my main renderer um, that I use, that and Maxwell, um, you have to tick anti-aliasing or you're gonna get jagged edges uh, for some reason, which is good because you can get quick previews otherwise and different things like that. So make sure you do that if you're using Final Render. Now this is the same for uh, you know all, all over the board the render elements. Um, in, this set, in this section usually this is blank but if you go to add you get this list of all of these different passes that you can render. Now some of them are renderer specific like I can't really render out mental ray passes with Final Render. I mean I guess I could try but I won't get any data. <clears throat> However, like Alpha, Atmosphere, Background, Blend, Diffuse, these ones that aren't like specific, these are specific to Final Render. Down here you've got Paint, you know, Object ID, Refraction, 
reflection, self illumination, shadow specular, all these different things. Um, these are, you know, the same kind of thing. You can render those with any renderer. Now you can see here, uh, we've got a few different, a few things here that are specific for fume effects. Uh, fume effects fire, fume effects smoke. I didn't render a smoke pass because I didn't simulate smoke, but I did render out the fire pass. As as you saw, I used that for that localized, nice, warm glow and to kind of add uh, warmth to the flame. I also, you can see a fume of, whoops, a fume effects uh, Z depth here. I, I rendered out. I didn't really use that in my comp. Uh, I had planned on using it for the depth of field, but I didn't get the data that I wanted because I used the fume effects. If I would have just used a Z depth pass, um, the, the thing is with that pass, uh, you don't get the flame calculated in. So you get the candle, the wick, the room, you know, everything but the flame. <laughs> so the flame ends up blurred because it's black in the mat or white in the mat or whichever you choose. So I'd have to cut, made a custom mat for that so I didn't use the Z depth. I just simulated it with a mask. Um, now I will uh, say that you can create a custom mask with two different passes. You can take the alpha channel or you can take the Z depth, normal just everyday Z depth. Then you can take the, where are we? The fume effects fire pass. You can combine those together and create a single alpha out of both of those in order to simulate Z depth and get proper depth of field in compositing. Uh, but I didn't go that far. Uh, I probably should have, I guess. But you can do that. You just take those, merge them together, create an alpha, pre molt them, and then send them into a Z blur uh, or you know whatever you use to get depth of field, whether it's sapphire or whatever plugins. Um, so you can do it that way, and then uh, I have the shadow pass, and just that I use the final render shadows, use this pass. But all these are useful in some way. You you can and don't always just look at the name and say, well, you know this this pass is good for only that. As we'll cover when I do that other tutorial um, here on CG Tools, we'll, we'll cover all. You know these passes are useful for a lot of different things. And um, so that's about as far as I'm going to go into that to, <laughs> so as to not spoil the multipass tutorial. So uh, anyway, that's what I did. And then to render these, you just click one, you know, highlight it, and you set your path. Like, see, I render everything now. I've been trying to limit myself only to open EXR image sequences. So um, this one, I, you know, you just set it here, set your path. And then I do the same for all of them. Render, and when you render, it's going to render your beauty pass, but then it's also going to, just in a split second, calculate these other passes and send them to the file path that you specified. And then uh, you use those in comp. All right, uh, so I hope this was informative. Um, look forward to that next one. I, I'm pretty sure it's already approved, uh, the multi-pass compositing uh, and rendering tutorial. Uh, we'll be doing a pretty interesting scene. Uh, big kind of uh, anyway I won't spoil it <laughs> it'll be good so uh, anyway my name is Evan Scheibel uh, check out the other fume effects tutorial uh, here on CG Toots Plus and um, thanks for watching and I hope you learned something